Welcome to Sky Team's People First with Morag Barrett. Welcome to this week's episode of People First. And my guest this week is Larry Robertson, who's an innovation advisor, helping people discover value at the nexus of leadership, entrepreneurship, and creativity. You're going to have to explain all of that to me, Larry, in just a moment. He's a Fulbright scholar and a popular columnist with Inc. Magazine, The Creative TV Post, CEO World Magazine, Smart Brief, and others. He's also the award-winning author of three books, A Deliberate Pause, The Language of Man, and today we're going to be talking about his latest book, Rebel Leadership. So, Larry, welcome to People First. Thank you so much. It's my honor to be here, Mark. All right. Well, as with every episode, I always start with the origin story. So when you, you were a wee lad, were you sitting there at school thinking, I want to be a Fulbright scholar? What, <laughs> what was it that was your dream as a, as a child? You know, it's interesting. I think about when, when people are asked that question, right, that, that it started with a question they were asked at that age. You know, what do you want to be when you grow up? And it, it may sound strange, but I don't remember anyone asking. And what I really remember is um, a certain freedom to explore. That was kind of a theme in my house, but I also grew up in the American Southwest and it it felt like it was a community theme in, in many ways. And even in school, I felt like there was a certain sense of freedom to explore that. And then I had all these very non-traditional examples of what you do in life around me. You know, I, my, my mother uh, worked and went to school to get a graduate degree while she was raising my brother and, and me. That was not typical of many of the moms around me mm -hmm. at that time, right? Um, I had a grandfather who these days we'd call an entrepreneur who during depression years started his own printing business and built it over time. Oh, wow. And, and it, it was it was what sustained the family and, and what he and my grandmother used to send two kids to college in a time when not everybody went to college. So I had all these non-traditional examples around me. And what I remember out of that was there are countless things that you can be and anything's possible. So go find it, stay open to that. I mean, those statements weren't made, but that impression was made. So I might've called out certain roles over the years. Like I want to be an oceanographer or I want to be an architect, but those really reflected more passions mm. or opportunities to discover something I was interested in at the time. I also remember knowing clearly what I didn't want to be. So oh, yeah. I come from a long line of lawyers, uh, including my father and, and then later my, my brother and cousins and uncles and grandparents and so on. And I knew I didn't want to be that. And the interesting thing is I didn't know anything about what it meant to be a lawyer. I just knew I wanted to be something different than that. So that's really what I remember as my origin, just kind of that environment that I grew up in. I love that because it's almost like there's a smorgasbord of choice. And the idea yes. that as a child or even as a teenager, when I think about my school, you have to pick your topics for the career you're going into. It is limiting. And I use myself as a role model. I mean, I'm on my fifth career. I was going to be an engineer, ended up in finance, moved to leadership development. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm an author and speaker. And who knows? And like you, I remember I didn't want to go into the family business mm. in that my mum and many of my relatives were professional musicians. So whilst I am a musician and music was part of growing up, I couldn't be bothered to practice. It's hard to be a professional. <laughs> so much like the lawyer was not going to do that, but was going to potentially follow my father into engineering. I just didn't know what flavor. And then hmm. God inspired and went into finance. So go figure. So it's a complicated weave. So so what did you take away then from those non-conventional, as you described them, role models? What hmm. have you carried into your career that's helped fuel your success today? Yeah. So I, I love hearing your background and your fifth career. And we, who knows, you might be in double mm -hmm. digits by, by the end of your lifetime of, of numbers of careers. My career has followed a similar path. And each time I've moved from one opportunity to the next, one role to the next, whatever it might be, it's because um, of this openness of how I, I kind of explored in my childhood and remaining open now to not think of what I'm doing in this moment as the end, 
In fact, I think if I thought about it that way, I would lose mm. all my motivation, all my energy, all my desire to want to do the next thing. But by staying open, it you not only see those opportunities in whatever your current career path is, but you see those opportunities that are on the edges or the border. And it didn't mean that I dropped one thing and went running after the next, but I would explore on those fringes all the time. Just a quick side note, in my second book, which was focused on creativity, I had this distinct honor of interviewing MacArthur Fellows. They're the winners of oh. this so-called Genius Award for Creativity. And one of them described to me this idea of the adjacent possible. And so what it what that means mm. is that rather than thinking about these huge goals we have in our own personal lives, our professional lives for our businesses, if we're leaders of businesses, as being uh, home runs, moon leaps, way out there somewhere, Stu Kaufman said, really, the biggest opportunities are adjacent to where you are right now. That's where the possible lies. And just by being willing to put your toe over the line and explore a little bit, you can't help but not only see new opportunities on the outside, when you come back to the world you know, over time, you start to see it differently. And, and the most powerful thing about the adjacent possible is the more you do that, the more you make it habitual to, to kind of embrace this idea of open thinking, mm -hmm. the greater the possible becomes. So you actually expand the adjacent possible beyond what you know now and what lies just beyond you. So I didn't know that term as I kind of grew up and grew through my career, but it's proved to be key to me. And frankly, it's the exact thing I turn around and try to teach my clients or my audiences when I speak or when I write. I'm trying to move people into the adjacent possible, but also to help them realize they have that power all on their own. I love that. It's making the wheels turn because that adjacent possible, it's it's inspiring without being necessarily intimidating. I'm thinking mm -hmm. of almost of a Venn diagram and this is what holds most of us, I know for my purpose, stuck is the comfort zone or the comfort couch. Adjacent possible feels like I can get up and step over into that versus a whole lot of pain and effort to at least peek around the corner and see what is possible. <laughs> Absolutely. Interesting. And you know what, what, what um, amplifies what you just said is that uh, and Stu would tell you this too, having explored this concept for a long time. When you do it, there's no expectation that, you know, lightning is going to strike from the sky and you're going to have that brilliant idea. That That's not the way it works. It's not the way creativity works. It's not the way innovation works. It's the the habit and, and the mindset of doing that, that willingness to maybe not even get off the couch. Maybe you just change the channel. Maybe you turn <laughs> off whatever the screen is and you pick up a book or a magazine or something like that. It's that habit of stepping out of your known zone, as I like mm -hmm. to think of it, that really produces those greater opportunities over time. In addition to that, you know, we think of things like creativity or innovation as problem solving devices, something we, we, we put towards that. It's not just this big uh, accomplishment we want to achieve, but sometimes we just need to solve a problem. Same thing works there. If you're in that habit of stepping just slightly out of your zone, toe over the line, as I like to think about it, you're more likely to be able to come up with solutions to those problems faster and in a more unique way than if you just went to that tool in an emergency. You make it sound so easy. So <laughs> yes. then a, a, a question, two questions actually coming to mind. First one, though, is toe over the line or you've jumped over it. Mm -hmm. What leadership lessons have you had to learn the hard way? Oh, wow. Gosh, how long is the show? <laughs> <laughs> Take the time you need. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I think the hardest lesson that I've learned is the one that keeps coming back. And that is that no matter who I might admire or model or aspire to, to be like, my style of, of leadership is never going to be the same as anybody else's. And, and we all know that conceptually, right? Yeah. But 
we still stumble back into it. We look for some yardstick to measure against, to say, I need to do that, or I need to do that in these ways, or whatever it is. Um, when I when I wrote my first book, and as I wrote the other two, I used to talk about these um, books that I call the My Story books, where somebody talks about their ter tremendous success. And it's really fun to read about. The mistake we make is when we try to make it our model. Mm -hmm. so I still read those kind of books. I still listen to the people that I meet and I want to know about their story. Kind of like you asked the origin story. Mm -hmm. It's that plus everything that led to their success. I want to know all those things. But the lesson I keep learning is, yes, but my version of that is always going to be different in some way. And to try to pursue that difference. So it's interesting. I just Googled while I was listening to you and I use this as part of my leadership programs to help reinforce that very point, Larry, that there isn't a one size fits all to leadership. Because <laughs> on my Google search, when I put in the word leadership, it returned 3.1 billion results. Wow. So not only is there not one, and you and I have contributed to those results, so go us. Of course. <laughs> and so my point there is, yes, it's, in, it's important because it informs. And we've got our own role models, the good, the bad and the ugly. But ultimately, it's our individual point of view. How do we want to feel in our presence? How do we want others to feel in our presence? And then being intentional and reflecting, whether it's daily, weekly or whatever, am I living up to my own benchmark? Right. And then course correcting along the way. So I, I, I think that's absolutely true. And this, I'm going to tie to one of your previous episodes. I, I can't remember how long ago it was, but you interviewed, um, I, I don't know him, Robert Glazer, I believe oh, yes, is his name. Robert, yeah. okay. and, and to me, there was a, it was a fascinating discussion in general, but there was a really interesting point in that you were talking about core values, right? Mm -hmm. So if we think about this, if I'm trying to grow as a leader, I, I, I just said, I can't just model off of some other individual as though I'm going to try to replicate that. In a similar way, Robert was saying, listen, um, it's fascinating that most people don't really know how to <clears throat> articulate their core values. OK, mm -hmm. so he was saying they don't know their core values, but they know when they've been violated. Oh, that was a yeah. really interesting line. So what's interesting, I think, about all of us as leaders is that we know what it is that attracts us to that concept of leading. We know what we want to contribute as leaders, you know, not just to our own record, but to others and, and, and so on. However, we haven't articulated that. And so to look at somebody else's story as the way to articulate that is absolutely the wrong thing. It would be like saying, tell me what my core values are rather mm -hmm. than tuning into that sense of, I know they've been violated. I Meaning, I know what they are. I just have yet to articulate them. And, and values, it, there's almost an infinite list of them and you can Google them and you'll find all sorts of checklists. And Robert himself has created several online self-study programs around identifying your values. And so as I think about that, if I look at the habits that allegedly mm. the best C tech leaders do. It's the get up at 4 a.m., work out for an hour, meditate. And well, I ain't doing that because I don't value mornings. I'm a night right. owl. There is no way. Well, you and I chatted. Here I am. I'm rolling in with my cup of coffee and a, a later morning start compared to many because that's how I'm hardwired and trying to force something different because I read it somewhere. Yes. It's just going to end up in tears for everybody, myself included. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and I'll throw one other piece in there. And again, this differs for each individual, mm -hmm. too. But that first point we talked about, like, what did I what did I learn in my origin moments and story go, going up? And I talked about that openness. I think that openness has to be there to say, one, I can be whatever kind of leader I want to be. By the way, I should anchor that in who I am, what I know mm -hmm. about myself. But two, as I go along cultivating that and tie it to your five careers so far, there are going to be adjustments that are made along the way. So, so my routine for getting going each day or my way of leading is itself going to evolve with time. And I should be as open to allowing that to happen as I am to not modeling someone else, if, if, if that makes sense. For example, um, as a writer, I used to look at those lists of, well, what are the best habits for writers and things like that? Mm -hmm. And one of the things that always said was, well, you, you write at a certain time of day, right? Oh, and gosh, you, no. and you, you turn everything off and you do it for two hours. 
Well, that yeah. didn't work for me, no. right? And in addition to that, um, people said you write in the mornings. Well, for years, my best writing was in the afternoon. And yet I fought that because the list said, said. no, it's the mornings. And guess what? Now my best mm -hmm. writing time is in the morning. So what's wrong with that? What's wrong with shifting to that? So I think it's it's interesting to say, I can't just look to the outside as models, but I also can't look to who I am now as the perfect model for who will who I will be in the next iteration. And the irony of us talking about this is not lost on me as also an author with a third book coming out this year, but the intent is that we are sh sowing those seeds, going back to what you said, and mm. giving people a different lens in which to think about the adjacent possible yes. for them in their leadership. So let's move to rebel leadership, how to thrive in uncertain times, which, hey, that is definitely today, tomorrow, yesterday, and goodness knows for how long. So tell us, what are we going to discover? What's the reader going to discover in Rebel Leadership? Well, I, I love the way that, that you introduced this, and we did not plan that. But you were talking about you know uncertainty being the reality now and that its existence, we don't know how long it's going to be. Well, th this is core to the book. This is one of the things you'll find. That uncertainty in our midst is unending. It always mm -hmm. has been, but it's a very, very different kind of uncertainty that we've been facing, not just in the last two years, but in the last 20. And the book really centers on, as we've had this increasing uncertainty and disruption and ambiguity, what I call our new abnormal, because mm -hmm. we don't really arrive at a steady state normal where we can count on that for some extended period of time. It, it keeps changing in lots of ways. If that is the state that we're in right now, all of us, and I think it is, and I think most people would overwhelmingly agree with that, how can we possibly lead in old ways? Because however we led in the past was a reflection of what did the environment demand of us or what mm -hmm. opportunity did the environment give us? And if we're still leading on that old model, there's no way that we can be prepared to deal with the threats, but also the opportunities that come from this new abnormal. So one of the key things you'll find in rebel leadership is the assumption that that uncertainty is going to be ongoing and it's our job now to embrace it. And then the book goes on to say, OK, how do you do that? And what are the patterns across organizations and leaders in the last 20 years that have worked, the people who are actually thriving in these uncertain times, what does that look like? And the book really lays out a framework rather than a formula, kind of going back to, I'm not telling the stories of others saying, you need to model that. I'm saying, here are the patterns that are common to the most diverse range of leaders and organizations. That means those patterns are also the most transferable because if they can exist in all those places, then they can transfer to you and me and to anybody else. That's really what the book focuses on. I, I like what you describe there, because again, we're opening up and challenging almost like the emperor's new clothes. And I did the same in the Future Proof Workplace with Linda Sharkey. Mm -hmm. We recognise that many of the leadership practices, management practices, attitudes to career and the where and how and who of work were still rooted sometimes in the 19th century in the Industrial Revolution and certainly yes. out of date for the 21st century. And so you taught there, you interviewed, I know, many leaders. So what were some of the common themes that came through and the conversations that really stood out for you? Sure. So there, there were five themes that stood out. I won't go through them all now, but I'll give you kind of a sampling of them. Mm -hmm. And what's important about these themes is they aren't a checklist either. Right. Mm -hmm. We talked about these checklists for leaders and writers and everything else. That is not what these themes are. What these themes say is they are powerful individually, but they're most powerful when they're considered together. So here's the interesting thing. One of the first starts with the individual. And it's this not just I was going to say it's this idea, but it's this answer I would get back from leaders, not just that I interviewed for this book, but over the past three and what I would ask them is, among, among other central questions, is there anything that has stood out consistently as pivotal to your success, your success mm -hmm. when things are going wrong, your success when things are going right? And to the person, their answer was soul. And soul in the context of rebel leadership and, and what we're talking about here isn't what people would normally think. That's the word they chose. But what they meant was a sense of your identity 
in the context of what you do and how what you do impacts or connects to others. So think about that. This is a really interesting thought. If you don't have a sense, not just of who you are, but of who you are in the context of what you do and how that connects mm -hmm. to and ripples to others, it's really hard to bring your best. It's really hard to know how you want to lead. And it's really hard to get other people to work with you, to follow you, to become leaders in their own right. So that soul mattering most was one of the key things. It also ties to this other one, which is uh, leadership moves across an organization. This idea of hierarchy, which, by mm -hmm. the way, goes back to the 19th century yeah. and those industrial revolution uh, techniques, as you know. Leadership really moves across an organization where the need is and where the right skills can fit it. And leadership doesn't always associate with a title. No. It's who can step up and bring those best skills and, and bring them to others in the right moment. Well, to have that, an organization has to have a clear shared purpose. And it can't just be a statement. It has to be operationalized. You have to use your purpose. Every, every single person every day in every decision and every action has to have a sense of what that collective purpose is. So think about those two themes all on their own. If you have a sense of who you are, your soul, your identity in the context of what you do and how it ripples to others, that informs that shared purpose. And the more people who have that, it doesn't mean they're all going to nod in, in you know, succession together and say, oh, we all think the same mm. things. No, they're each going to bring who they truly are to that shared purpose they're cultivating together. So you're tapping more minds, you're tapping more ideas, you're tapping more passions. So people want to show up to drive towards that shared purpose. These things are critical, but if they're not in use, I mean, we've talked about the idea of shared purpose for over a decade at least, yet most organizations still don't step up to make it a powerful asset for themselves. And that's because they don't use it. It doesn't guide anything. It sits in a frame on the wall or in yeah. some plan on their on their PC, and they never look at it rather than operationalizing it to every decision. So I think those are two of the most critical patterns, and they lead to a third, and I'll stop right here. This has to be cultural. If okay. it's not a priority as a culture to pursue things like shared purpose, to empower people to do that, to expect them to step up to those leadership roles, it's just bullshit. And, and it, when Deloitte did a study a couple of years ago, they found that 98% of senior level executives said culture was critical to who they were as a business. And less than 50% of them knew or could define what their culture was. Less than a third said they tried to incorporate it into how they do things day to day. And the numbers keep scaling down. So we talk about it and we, we kind of internally recognize its value. But if we don't make these things cultural, they're dead on arrival. Oh, there are so many different directions I want to go with this. Because I mean, I, I mean, I, yes, so many different directions. Because I'm thinking about that sense of belonging and connection. And of course, for those of us who are now working through this little three by five video camera, yes. there is distance, there is disconnection, we're missing some parts. And it's all, it links to the diversity inclusion conversations, culture, you talked on that, the number of leaders who I'm seeing weaponizing mm -hmm. culture that to your point, they probably can't articulate in a, that's why we have to come back to the office so that we can do our culture. And the reality is no, culture isn't a place. Culture is the, the how business gets done and what does it feel like to be part of this organization? Am I on the inside or the outside? Does yes. it make me thrive? And we can do that from anywhere. I mean, mm -hmm. Robert Glaze has pro uh, proved that. He's, his company's been virtual from the get-go, as has Sky Team. The key is, though, we have to be explicit in how we're going to experience it. How are we going to create scheduled spontaneity for what we used to do at the water cooler and the chance yes. conversations. How do we recreate that across time and space? That's that's part of the conversation. So when you think about the different directions, diversity, inclusion, <laughs> the sense of self and connecting to an organization's purpose, the culture piece, where do you get the most excited when you're working with your clients? I get the most excited when 
there's a word in what you just described that is just sticking in my head and that's weaponizing. Mm -hmm. So another, another way of thinking about that, about culture and how a lot of leaders use it or pursue it or whatever it is, is they mandate it. They say, this is going to be our culture. Get, get back to work. Right. So what excites me most when I work with my clients is when they do the exact opposite and their first discussion is, okay, as we decide what culture is here, as we decide what we're going to do with it, who are we going to include? Mm -hmm. And those leaders and those organizations who, who not only say, but walk the talk of, I'm going to include everyone, have the best odds of actually tapping the power of culture. I mean, culture should be every organization's chief competitive advantage, but that takes work. And it involves everybody who delivers on whatever the product or the service or the combination is. Everybody has a hand in that, even if they're getting the hand off, even if they're not creating it mm -hmm. to begin with. So if they're not involved in that, if they can't articulate what culture is, if they don't feel themselves in it, then there's a long way to go. I, one of the people I interviewed for the most recent book, that Russell Schaefer at, at Walmart, and he's, he's one of the heads of diversity and inclusion and, and mm -hmm. equity there. I asked him, you know, how do you define culture? Walmart claims that culture is so valuable. I, I, I hear it talked about in, in virtually every conversation and press release I see from the company. And he said, culture is who we are and what we do right now. It's not who we were. It's not mm -hmm. who we aspire to be. It is this guide. It is a litmus test of every action and every decision by every person every day. And if we don't do that, Russell said, it's also our reckoning. So we're not going to leap to that overnight, but this idea of culture being this sense of everything you're doing right now in this moment and what that means as it points to your shared purpose and why the hell you're there in the first place, that's where culture begins. So what excites me is when you realize that and you want to include everybody in the conversation, you're more likely to get to the benefits of culture than those who just declare it or try to, to weaponize it. Feels like we've almost come full circle in terms of the three billion leadership results and coming up with your individual point of view of what makes for a great leader. So for people listening who may be an individual within a larger organization, what are some of the first steps that they can take to get a pulse check on the culture of their team or their division or their part of the business to start the conversation and move towards rebel leadership? Sure. Uh, I'll share with you quickly uh, uh, one of my favorite tools for doing that. You can use individually as small groups, as a collective. And it's called the, the, the five habits of the mind. And there are five questions. How do we know what we know? Is there a pattern? Some form of the question, what if? Mm -hmm. Is there another way? And who cares? And think about this. How do we know what we know is looking at what our underlying assumptions are. How often do we actually go back and check those? Sometimes they're right, but many times they're opening the door to something new. When we go to something new, we want to know what the pattern is, not the aberration. If we're seeing a pattern in a problem or an opportunity, that's what we're after. Those two things, questioning our assumptions, looking for that pattern, always lead to some what if. What if we solve the problem this way? What if we innovated in a different direction? The question of, is there another way is to come back and do all that again, because mm -hmm. there's always another way. So it's about not getting married to your idea and looking at the full scope of what the opportunity is. What hones it all is that last question, who cares? Because if nobody cares, it doesn't matter. So as an individual, if you look at your work, if you look at your company, you can ask those questions and they're going to tell you a lot about how known is the culture? How active is the culture? Is it in the right place? And it works in a group and it works in a, in a company to say, this is where we are now. Where do we want to go? How do we bring that into our day to day? I, I just love those five questions. And I think they're enormously powerful. And what I love about there, it connects for me, that dot of leadership isn't just at the top of the organization. Influencing, shaping color uh, culture doesn't start or isn't responsibility from top down. Wherever you are in the organization, you can make an intentional choice for the culture that you're creating in your leadership style, the culture you're creating around your team, and then the ripple effect goes from there. So that don't wait. Absolutely, absolutely true. And if you don't do that, if you don't, we won't say weaponize, but if you don't embrace and leverage that asset, individual, 
you know, all the way to organization, then you are going to contribute to the great reshuffle or the great exodus or whatever you want to call it. Those people who are leaving, we're increasingly finding are asking some version of those five habits yeah. of mind questions. And if they're not seeing it in their own workplace and they don't feel they can move the dial, they're leaving not to sit on the beach. They're leaving to find a place that gets it, that, that has a sense of those things that matches with their own soul and that they prefer to be and invest their time and energy in. So these are really, really important questions, no matter who you are or what you're trying to do within an organization. And the key is you're going to get a culture no matter what. The question is, do you get the culture you want or the culture you deserve? And in either case, is it the culture you need in order to deliver the results, the experience that you and your business aspire to? So it's an active, living, breathing thing. Could, couldn't have said it better myself. And, you know, the absence of culture is culture. You know, mm -hmm. it is a form of culture, not a good one. But, you know, so if we're if we're mentally engaged in everything you just said, thinking about culture in that active, open way we're already a step better than those who don't even think about culture or declare it and move on from it. Okay, Larry, you've got us actively thinking about culture, about our individual leadership. So how do we learn more? Where do we go to find out more about your work and continue the conversation? Yeah, I appreciate you asking. The best place to go is my main website. It's lrspeaks.com, my initials and the word speaks.com. And there you can sample articles from the columns, learn about the books, sample speaking, see what I do advisory wise. It's all there. OK, thank you, Larry. I wish you ongoing success. I look forward to future conversations. But thank you for joining me on People First. Likewise, a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining Morag today. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe so you don't miss a thing. If you learned something worth sharing, share it. Cultivate your relationships today when you don't need anything before you need something. Be sure to follow Sky Team and Morag on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And if you have any ideas about topics we should tackle, interviews we should do, or if you yourself would like to be on the show, drop us a line at info at skyteam.com. That's S-K-Y-E team.com. Thanks again for joining us today. And remember, business is personal and relationships matter. We are your allies.